Top 10 Cars That Suck Welcome to this video about some of the worst cars that have been made. We got some usual suspects and some more unexpected ones, and also a mix of old and new. Their common denominator is that they all suck in one way or another, or in some cases, in all possible ways. Enjoy! Gee whiz! If you're looking for a car that will make you feel like a kid and look completely silly, then look no further than the Indian-made Riva G-Wiz, arguably the world's worst car. With its 13 kilowatt of power and six lead-acid batteries, it's sure to be an adventure. A slow and painful one. Forget about speed. This little number tops out at 30 miles per hour, so you'll never get into any real trouble. And its front end, window glass, shut lines, and paint finishes look like something a preschooler made, so you'll be sure to turn heads in the worst way possible. Plus, with its puny electric motor and six lead-acid batteries, you won't be able to fit the four people it promises to hold. More like four marshmallows. But don't worry, when you're aggravated by all of its flaws, the rainwater will cool you down as it leaks through the bodywork. So if you're looking for a car that will make you feel like a kid and keep you safe from any real danger, the G Wiz is the perfect choice. It's the worst car on the road, or the safest toy in the toy box. Reliant Robin. Ah, yes, the Reliant Robin three wheeler, the source of so much laughter and mirth. It's a car, it's a bike, it's a tricycle. Some say it's a car, others say it's a joke. With only three wheels, it makes you wonder how it could even pass as a car, but somehow it does, and it even held its own on the roads for almost 30 years. In the UK, the original Regal model was only fit for a motorcycle license, but the rules changed in 2001 and suddenly the Robin needed a full driving license, despite its lack of wheels. Talk about cutting it short! It came with a 750cc four-cylinder engine, upgraded to an 850cc in 1975. It was dangerously fast for its construction with a top speed of 85 miles per hour. One of its few redeeming features was that it was surprisingly economical with 70 miles per gallon. It was also lightweight, which meant it could handle corners well, or so they say, those who survived. The Robin went through a few iterations over its production run until it finally retired in 2001. Prices had risen to 9,000 pounds for the top spec models, but it will still be remembered fondly, or not so fondly, depending on who you ask. So the next time you see a Reliant Robin three-wheeler, don't be fooled by its cute looks. It may just be trying to lure you in for a ride. Just remember to have your life insurance in order first. Citroen C3 Pluriel. Citroen C3 Pluriel seems to be the result of an idea hatched while the designer was drunk. For reasons that are still unclear, the French car manufacturer wanted to combine five cars into one. Taking the existing C3 Super Mini as a base, the C3 Pluriel was meant to be a family hatchback, a saloon with a sunroof, a convertible, a roadster, and a pickup truck. It unfortunately fell short of meeting all of these goals as you might have expected. Some of the design decisions made seem to be ill-advised at best. The canvas roof was able to retract electronically, however, the roof rails were very difficult and fiddly to take off and had to be left outside of the car because of the lack of space. So if it started to rain, you were up the proverbial creek. To convert it into a pickup truck, the rear seats had to be flattened and the tailgate lowered. But this is illegal to do in several countries since it would block the number plate from view. Didn't think of that, did ya? In addition, the car itself wasn't up to par. The interior was cheaply made. The driving experience was as interesting as watching paint dry. And the cabin space was really small. Many owners also reported that it was prone to leaks due to its poor construction. A real case of jack of all trades and master of none. Austin Allegro. The Austin Allegro, a product of British Leyland in the 1970s, was so bad it's a wonder that it's still around today, like an old bad joke you can't get rid of. It had an awkward, dumpy design and a quartic steering wheel that was necessary to view the dials, but was so bad even the Metropolitan Police wouldn't approve. The 1975 facelift and the 1979 equipped model, complete with silver bodywork and orange stripes, were even worse than the original. If you can believe it, its lack of space, range of underpowered engines, and higher price than its competitors made it a laughing stock. It was so bad that it would break down just looking at it. You had to be extra careful when jacking it up in case the back window fell out and the doors jammed shut. 
No, seriously, not joking. This earned it the nickname All Agro. With only 650,000 cars sold over nine years, it's no surprise that the Allegro was an absolute flop. Its replacement, the Austin Maestro, was welcomed with open arms and with good reason. Good riddance. Ford Edsel. The Edsel, Ford's ambitious attempt to revolutionize the auto industry with its iconic, or was it ironic, horse collar nose. It was meant to be the car of the future, but unfortunately, it was a future that no one wanted to see. Despite an investment of $400 million, the Edsel failed to spark any interest with potential buyers due to its unpopular design and its horse collar nose, which looked like it had been stolen from a stable. The result? It cost Ford an estimated $350 million, leading to bankruptcy for Ford dealers nationwide. Its legacy, however, lives on. The term Edsel is now synonymous with a marketing campaign gone wrong. The last model, the Ranger, was a wrong car at the wrong time, selling only 3,000 units. Ultimately, they should have kept it at just 375 horses in the engine, but dropped the horse collar in the front. It goes to show that sometimes, even with an expensive investment and groundbreaking features, you just can't beat good old-fashioned aesthetics. Yugo GV Now, we come to a car that I wouldn't trust with my life, and neither should you, if you hold your life dear. This particular brand has been the butt of more car jokes over the past two decades than most others, and even NPR's Car Talk called it the worst car of the millennium. Malcolm Bricklin, the U.S. importer, was determined to make Americans walk to work, and his plan involved the Yugo GV. It was like a Soviet bloc version of a lemon, but with a few added bonuses, like carpet, whatever that means, and a rear window defroster, which was probably designed to keep your hands warm while you were pushing the car down the road after it had broken down. The Yugo was known for its unreliable engine and electrical system, and random parts that tended to fall off. So if you wanted to get to work, you either had to walk or take your chances with the Yugo. It is widely agreed to be very poorly made and unreliable, which is why you should avoid this and stick to cars that actually run. Its reputation took a huge hit in 1989 when a Yugo was blown off a bridge in Michigan, which tragically resulted in the death of the driver. Three years later, they finally realized what a disaster this car was and imports of it were stopped. It's no wonder why, because this car was basically a rolling death trap. Pontiac Aztec At its unveiling at the Detroit Auto Show, there was a collective gasp from the audience, and it was not from admiration. It was clear that the Pontiac Aztec was deemed as an ugly creation that instantly brought out feelings of hate in all who were unfortunate enough to lay eyes on this eyesore of a car. It was a textbook example of something that had been whooped with the ugly stick. In interviews with GM's designers, the initial cool and tough concept of this car had been altered and cut down on the altar of costs and economics and ended up as a bulky plastic mess. This is a classic example of going off track with car design. People tend to be drawn to cars that look similar to them, and the Aztec was far from appealing with its multiple eyes and extra nostrils, making it appear deformed and menacing, meaning only Quasimodo would be able to relate. Underneath the hideous exterior, there was actually a functional and reliable crossover, but that is to no avail when people run screaming when they see it. The company sold only 5,000 units of the model in 2005, which is a true testament to its ugliness. In fact, Pontiac itself had to close its doors only five years later, probably due to models like the Frankenstein Aztec. Ford Pinto Ladies and gentlemen, have you heard of the Pinto? I guess most of you have. It's a car that's famous for being dangerous. You see, if it gets rear-ended, it could catch fire. Now, I'm no expert, but that doesn't sound great, and it gets worse. Ford actually ran the numbers and calculated how much money they'd have to pay out in settlements compared to if they reinforced the car's rear end. They decided it was cheaper to not make the changes, and so the Pinto made it onto the worst list. I mean, it wasn't necessarily such a bad car in other ways, but it was pretty volatile. With Ford's management basically saying, let them burn to their customers, this car definitely deserves to be on the worst car list for that fact alone. Chevrolet Corvair Well, have you heard of the Chevrolet Corvair? Of course you have! 
It's a car that will make your heart race, but maybe not in the way you'd hope. It's a rear-engine car, and it has an unfortunate tendency to spin out due to its weight distribution. It's a novel and interesting enough design, with a flat six engine in the back and an unsafe swing axle rear suspension. So it's got the looks, but it's also dangerous, and it could have been made safer. But of course, Chevrolet was reluctant to spend a few dollars. But luckily, Ralph Nader wrote a book about it called Unsafe at Any Speed and pointed out the Corvair's various failings, like the single-piece steering column that could impale the driver in a crash, and the tendency to leak oil, and of course the poor steering and control of the vehicle. I guess Ralph Nader was right. It was unsafe at any speed. Trabant. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready to hear the story of the car that tarnished the glorious reputation of communism. Joking, we are of course talking about the Trabant, or Trabi, among friends, who are few and far between. When it was released in the 1950s, it was already considered an antique. It was the East German version of the Volkswagen Beetle. With its 18 horsepower, two strokes engine, it was no Ferrari. But that's not all. This so-called people's car smoked heavily and often lacked basic features like brake lights or turn signals. The earlier models didn't even have a fuel gauge, and it came with a dipstick to put in the gas tank. The tolerances and fit for the parts and the bodywork is a complete joke. A bad one at that. The body was constructed with a material called Duroplast, reinforced with recycled fibers such as cotton and wood. Talk about taking recycling to the next level. Make garbage out of garbage. Ah, there's nothing like a little bit of East German charm, eh? But perhaps the most remarkable thing about the Trabi is its role in the fall of the Berlin Wall. Thousands of East Germans drove their Trabants across the border when the wall crumbled. The Trabi quickly became a symbol of liberation, as it was abandoned by its drivers shortly after crossing the border. The phrase, ich bin junk, I am junk, was said to be a common expression uttered by East Germans as they left their Trabants behind. Who knew that junk could be so liberating? Thanks for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned to our channel for more automotive antics. And remember to subscribe if you don't want to miss out on all the fun. See ya!